Welcome to Consumer Connections, a podcast series brought to you by Scylla. I'm your host, James Pikeaway, joined by my co-host, Faisal Khan. Together, we'll be guiding you through the marketing and insights landscape of the Arab region and beyond. Consumer Connections is your passport to demystifying the intricate landscape of marketing. We welcome expert strategists, marketing trailblazers, and insight leaders to peel back the layers of consumer research, offering their raw, first-hand views on the insights that enhance our dialogue with consumers. The theme of this podcast is unlocking customer experience with technology and insights. Faisal, who's joining us on this podcast? We are thrilled to introduce you to our guest, Ankesh Agarwal, Group CX Senior Manager at Majid Al Futaim. Ankesh is a renowned and trusted authority within the Arab community and beyond. His expertise has garnered numerous accolades, counting him among the top 100 global customer experience thought leaders and the top 250 global insights professionals. Ankesh's illustrious career spans across prominent organizations like Al Futaim, Capillary Technologies, and Kantar. He currently plays a key role in shaping customer experience strategy at Majid Al Futaim. What truly sets Ankesh apart is his fervor for customer experience. This passion permeates his work not only in his professional roles, but also as a prolific author, engaging speaker, and insightful lecturer on topics centered around customer experience. Ankesh, it is an absolute pleasure to have you joining us. Great to have you with us. This is really exciting. I'm I'm really interested in the fact that you've come from customer experience. That's where you are now. You're living in that world. But you came to customer experience from an insights background. Tell us a little bit about that change. I think insights and experience are intertwined. So probably experience is uh, a newer terminology or newer discipline which has come up. But if you, uh, if I remember my old days when I started working 16, 17 years ago, we used to do customer satisfaction studies. We used to do, uh, you know, uh, work on insights towards customer understanding, customer understanding on their interaction with their different touch points of different clients. So it's uh, not new that way. Uh, but if I see from a experience perspective, uh, the discipline has evolved quite a bit in the last few years. And people, uh, you know, have uh, specifically work, started working on experience. But my trigger point to move from insights to purely a customer experience role was when I joined Alpha Them. That was my first client side role. Prior to that, I was working in insights. And it was a mix of, you know, brand insights and advertising insights and customer satisfaction insights. When I saw a large part of my role there was on customer satisfaction and customer experience. And when I saw things actually getting or uh, putting, um, getting put in action, and that's where, you know, my curiosity and my inquisitiveness uh, took me uh, to a kind of a stand that I should do more of it. And then there was no looking back. It's been seven years now. I worked with a software startup after that, which was, again, related to customer experience, CRM loyalty. Then I took uh, another role in a consulting firm, which was purely a customer experience role. And that's where, you know, uh, my uh, stint with the customer experience and technology grew. You know, my uh, passion towards technology used in customer experience grew. And then now uh, I'm with Majid Al Futhim uh, for the last two, two and a half years working on CX strategy, uh, VOC insights, and, uh, you know, continuous improvement, design, and so on and so forth. So, but uh, this is a fascinating world, believe me. In the last few years, it has grown a, uh, a whole lot. What, what, what's changed? When you're talking about it, it's growing in the last couple of years. Yes. What, what's changed in the last couple of years that excites you? I think if I... Uh, if I go back in history, okay, so when I was a kid, uh, my father was a banker, okay, so he retired from uh, a government back back in India, and I still remember when I was, I think, 10, 12 years old, uh, one day I was going to school, he said, after school, why don't you go to a, uh, one of my branches and uh, try opening a student account, that, that was a new thing, okay, and he wanted me to get that experience and then narrated back to him, played back to him. And um, uh, so, of course, I went there. I was not supposed to tell that I'm uh, my, my father is this, and I got the entire experience. But I think about uh, almost um, uh, towards the end of the experience, I was almost failed. So that <laughs> means these guys said these guys were almost uh, about to shoo me away that uh, you can't get that account. So then somebody uh, who was uh, known to my father who saw me, and then entire thing was done. But if I look at, I mean, this was about thirty years back. Okay, so my father took notes of, uh, you know, what my experience was. And he then, uh, in today's parlance, that'll be customer journey design. It's more right. sophisticated, right? Okay. But that was more anecdotal back then. But in the last two years, so uh, the last three, four years, so you see, because the passion towards experience has evolved. So uh, the discipline has grown. And there are a lot of correlations and a lot of, uh, you know, empirical data, which is available. 
hmm. for uh, you know experience generating loyalty experience generating roi and that has actually is kind of a positive uh, cycle or a positive circle hmm. so it's got uh, on from strength to strength so ankesh you've very interesting you're saying that it's not a new concept right cx in some shape or form has always been there over the years right from 30 years back when you were a child it's just become more sophisticated and i think cx as a terminology has become a buzzword you know but is there a trigger point in your mind where this it transitioned from this traditional concept of just customer satisfaction customer experience to actually a dedicated cx focus with now organizations having large cx teams i think uh, again if i uh, go back in history and this is a question which uh, comes to me quite often so uh, i think initially when um, the industrial era started so it was all about a product if you make a good product it'll sell you make money hmm. then it became the product became ubiquitous so everybody was uh, you know trying to make the same kind of product uh, the product was not a differentiation anymore hmm. then probably came brand advertising and uh, they started differentiating the brand okay but then that also become kind of ubiquitous everybody was starting you know to develop stronger brands and do advertising reach to the right customers and so on and so forth uh, so in the last few years what i've seen is that see pr- don't get me wrong so product and brand will stay the main stay if you don't have a good product or if you don't have a good brand okay. customer experience do nothing but customer experience has become on top of these two big pillars a differentiation so people are willing to spend people are willing to buy a product or avail a service where they get a better experience versus others because the product are similar brands are strong and uh, uh, probably the pricing is similar as well because a very competitive market okay so that's i think the trigger point in the last seven eight years hmm. to create that differentiation people have started putting more focus on experience hmm. and that's how the discipline is evolved oh. yeah how are you collecting the data that's necessary to make your customer experience decisions oh that I mean in terms of data so there's a <laughs> you can go on and on <laughs> oh yeah, yeah absolutely so if i look at the key uh, data points which we use internally so of course the first one is listening to customers through a voice of customer program hmm. so we have a large customer program voice of customer program where we get about 2 million responses every year wow wow that's and we data. and that's across the brands we analyze that data uh, but that's to my mind uh, a foundation uh, data layer you can uh, you know build a lot of insights on top of that hmm. so what we typically see is that the voice of customer program which becomes a bedrock of whatever you're doing in customer experience can branch out into three different or three possible uh, action streams mm-hmm. the first one is your continuous improvement yeah. wherein whatever process you have if there's a broken process you can fix it hmm. if there are minor tweaks you want to do in a process you can do that hmm. the second is design maybe you want to reimagine the process once again mm. okay the process is there mm-hmm. so people are willing that process it may be broken you fixed it but there's a need that could be done in a very simplified way if mm. you look at for example uh, uh, when apple came in or tesla came in so before that i mean if you look at the regular car so there are so many uh, you know gadgets and knobs and uh, hubs but if you look at tesla it's a it's a kind of a ipad right so it's simplified thing mm. so people could have made um, those knobs into touch buttons a lot right. of people have done that but tesla took a, a very reimagined or a very new kind of approach the third could be innovation and that's what we are venturing into these days uh, which is cx led innovation hmm. which is uh, you know looking at a latent need which is not being catered to in the market right now okay. and how can you create those experiences which are not there at, at all people are not exposed to at all Mm, so these are things the three branches which um, uh, you know uh, a kind of voice of customer program as a fundamental source of uh, information can do that okay. but to your question so voice of customer you can have social uh, media chatter you can have contact center you can listen to people uh, calls uh, you can mm-hmm. listen to listen to uh, uh, them on social media you can uh, look at uh, you know uh, the transactional data you can do focus group interviews you can do in depth interviews and you can you know i mean the sources are immense but to my mind the first three things which i talked about how do you use that data is extremely important and is this data when you're talking about data is this data of your own customers or do you go beyond to understand people who are not your customers it's it's both actually mm. so because one of the big tenets uh, from uh, from our company is building superiority in whatever we do and, super- and, and you cover a lot of terrain it actually may not be a bad idea to 
talk about what all terrains marginal for them is into because i don't know how many of our <laughs> listeners actually relate to actually yeah. the actual brands they're interacting with day in and day out with marginal for them maybe it we did. can start with that <laughs> no, absolutely i think it took um, a bit of time for me when i joined the company to assimilate the number of brands we have <laughs> <laughs> so we have multiple uh, verticals and i think the biggest vertical is uh, our grocery retail which is car four so then we have malls a mall of emirates and a lot of there are city center and city centers and we have malls in egypt uh, and uh, across the region um, then uh, we have cinemas we have vox cinemas so that's our own brand we have a lot of uh, entertainment concepts a uh, ski dubai is one of them we recently opened snow abu dhabi you should go there uh, and a uh, snow oman in muscat uh, then we have uh, a smaller uh, concepts like magic planet etc then we also have residential uh, communities so tilal al gaf uh, in dubai there's one in sharjah there is one in uh, muscat mm-hmm. so where we are uh, giving a very differentiated kind of living experience to our customers so so the the list goes on we have fashion retail <laughs> and you're have, living with <laughs> data from for all these sectors right from malls to grocery to real estate it must be a nightmare for you <laughs> but i think uh, nightmare yes but it's an opportunity as well yeah. <laughs> you know that's so true. that's why we have a loyalty program which is a uh, uh, digital digital only lo- loyalty program which is called share so that's program basically that program basically uh, so uh, it binds all the business units and we see cross selling up selling opportunities wow. uh, we try and enrich that data with customer information on their likes preferences etc and see what else can we interact them with i'm just thinking going back to what faisal was saying the data wrangling that you have to do with all of these different verticals and assembling that data and then trying to make sense of it incredible incredible indeed and i think that's why uh, when faisal you're talking about cx team so we have a large team as well so you about uh, i think about 30 people wow, who it's a lot. live eat <laughs> breathe sleep cx okay mm-hmm. and to your question it is difficult right so how do you use that data so we have basically decentralized our cx function mm-hmm. i think cx function uh, is like a startup so mm-hmm. when you uh, start a cx function you probably are like two or three people mm-hmm. sitting around a desk Mm-hmm. and if you everybody knows what everybody else is doing mm-hmm. and if you have a problem if you have a, a brainstorming to be done you don't put in calendar invites you just stand up and shout let's huddle up mm-hmm. okay and then slowly it grows and you become a more institutionalized uh, institutionalized function and um, uh, so what we have done is that now we have decentralized the entire cx function for different units we have a central unit Uh, which i'm a part of which mm-hmm. basically looks after strategy and looks after partnerships and etc etc and then for execution of that strategy to taking that forward with that business we have uh, teams in retail we have teams in entertainment we have teams in uh, communities etc because if you ask me can i be a um, subject matter expert of all the uh, kind of businesses we are in no i can't right? so these people they for example somebody is in grocery retail mm-hmm. they will know that in and out Correct. and they in turn in the each of the markets they will have their representatives who are representing cx there or who are implementing cx in and out day in and day out and looking at you know what's happening around the customers observing them and so on and so forth mm-hmm. yeah there has been a lot of uh, impact of covid in terms of how cx is viewed how have you maneuvered through that pre covid and post covid phase when it comes to cx I think covid uh, definitely was a big disruptor especially for us because uh, we come from a re- retail background hmm. and uh, you know people stop coming to malls people stop coming to our stores so that was a big uh, dent in our business but I think we we did well we pivoted very quickly say for example our uh, grocery business car for is predominantly a brick and mortar business we hmm. we try to create good experience for people to in a very mundane chore mm-hmm. when they have to come and buy their weekly groceries so we have large scale stores and we uh, want people to come and enjoy their shopping enjoy in double quotes and uh, yeah, you know uh, uh, come again and buy more so but now uh, the stores were closed people aren't coming by so we pivoted we uh, enhanced our digital footprint and see in terms of employees as well so uh, what we try doing was to uh, you know have happy customers you have a happy have you have to have happy employees so that's i think a age old adage uh, but uh, what we did was for entertainment business the cinemas business the entire thing was shut nobody was coming to see movies movies were not being produced and so on and so forth so uh, we got those people to work in large dark stores for carrefour mm-hmm. we trained them in uh, you know packing grocery picking and packing grocery and then uh, those were being delivered to people's house 
Okay. So the shift uh, in consumer behavior is that yes, people, some of the people have stuck to you know uh, buying stuff online. Our cinema business, we also started. Uh, we we uh, realized that people are watching uh, their movies or series on OTT now. You know, Netflix and Prime. And what we started back then in, in uh, during COVID time was that we started delivering our popcorns to people's house. You're watching a movie, have our popcorns. Okay? <laughs> you are not coming to us, but then, but that's that continues. People buying uh, groceries yeah. online, that continues. So uh, what we are trying to do is, of course, try to create a balance, plus try to create a omni-channel uh, kind of a approach wherein, say, in grocery you have a kind of click and collect. Mm -hmm. So you do not have to, you know, uh, spend time in, you know, putting stuff in your basket. But you do everything, uh, you know, beforehand, and you just pick up the stuff. Mm -hmm. Plus, within the store, we are trying to uh, digitize our offerings as well. So we have a lot of uh, self-checkout counters using technology so that people do not have to queue up and they, you know, uh, just do it all by themselves. Customer experience sounds like such a simple concept when you hear it, but it's so complicated when, when you actually hear about <laughs> it and get into the details in terms of there's a lot that goes behind keeping your customers happy. <laughs> I'd love you to talk a little bit about some of the innovations that have succeeded and some of them that you've had to backpedal on. But I want to, before I do that, I want to jump in on talking about Vox and talking about your popcorn idea, which I'm a user of that. <laughs> and I've got to say, one of the things I loved about the popcorn delivery, and I still get popcorn delivered, yeah. is in the peak of COVID, not only were you delivering the popcorn, but on the popcorn bags were messages written by the staff. And I don't know if they're still doing that, but I loved that. And it was just, have a great day. Thank you. And that really made me feel good. And I and I was sitting there going, what a great innovation. This such a simple thing, so easy, but it made me feel attached to the brand. Absolutely. And I think uh, those are a few things which digitization uh, you know, cannot do. So that handwritten note, or when you walk into a store, somebody gives you a personalized hello. Uh, they speak to you warmly. Uh, they uh, you know empathize with you if you have a problem, and they support you. So that's something uh, AI or a robot cannot do. <laughs> have there been times when you when we talk about CX and we talk about innovation where you something has just been too far ahead of its time and you've had to dial it back? Sometimes yes, um, but I think we we always have to take that uh, you know leap of faith and uh, do things because uh, some of the things are ahead of time uh, or some of the things are ahead of the competition. Mm. So what we need to see is probably are we mm. uh, ahead of competition? That's the first thing. Uh, but uh, if it is ahead of time, what we try and do is we try to educate our customers. Mm. So that's you know one of the uh, important things which I've seen or uh, probably having an insights background helped me here. Yes, I'm okay, sure. <laughs> so consumer behavior uh, has to be... Uh, you know, people have to be taught, people have to be uh, spoken with, people have to be exposed to different kind of things. Uh, Dubai or UAE is still a market where you have people from all across the world who have different levels of exposure to different kind of technologies, different kind of offerings. So you will have a kind of mix here. But if you go to a, a more traditional market like Oman or Kuwait or Saudi, where you have to do a lot of education for newer things or newer technology, and it takes time to take off. Hmm. Yeah. It's interesting that throughout the discussion, I think you've use the word technology, digitization a lot. And I've noticed this about CX and full credit to CX as a as a vertical, that I think they've been the first ones to leverage the power of technology, unlike any other sector has. I think technology uh, makes uh, or accelerates CX. Hmm. But um, as, uh, as I always say, technology is just an enabler. Hmm. So you have to start from the customer. You have to start from the customer need or the customer pain points you're trying to solve. Because I've seen a, um, a lot of cases where people... You know, start with technology and fail. So, but if you start with the customer, you'll never fail. I mean, that's, uh, or you will fail less. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so if I see uh, in terms of technology, there are multiple technologies, or if I see categorized technology into two parts. One is um, the kind of technology which the customer experience professionals can use. Mm. So you can have, uh, you know, so for example, I'm talking about uh, uh, 2 million responses every year from our voice of customer program. Can I do it manually? Can I do it over the phone? I can't. So it has to be technology-led. Then there are some more sophisticated ways of, uh, you know, collecting and disseminating information if you want to do customer journey, project management, etc., etc. There are so many tools which are available for a customer experience professional. On the other side, if I look at customer-facing technology, hmm. right? So that's another thing which uh, basically helps customer create that experience or helps us create that experience for the customer. 
Um, if I give an example, uh, if you go to the Mall of Emirates Carrefour uh, store, so there's a small um, outlet near the metro exit, which is called Carrefour City Plus. Okay. So we uh, use technology there uh, uh, to so basically create a kind of an Amazon Go experience wherein people, it's an un, uh, unmanned store, there's no person there. You just you know tap your card, you walk in, you pick stuff and you walk out. That's about it. Okay, oh. so there are I think 60, 70 cameras uh, which are up there, which will see which product have you picked up. So they will register that product and with your credit card or your loyalty program, either of them, so it will get billed to you. So, but the use case was that people who are going towards Metro or coming from Metro, they want to quickly grab something and the assortment is very different. The assortment is grab and go, right? Mm. So, so that's uh, one of the examples of technology. Another thing I was talking about, for example, in grocery retail was our self-checkouts or scan and go. So wherein, you know, you pick a scan gun, you do all the stuff by yourself, and then you do not have to, you know, queue up for waiting. waiting I, I love that. So in my community <laughs> where I live, they've the Carrefour, there's a Carrefour Express, and uh, they've got a self check, and I just love it. You know, absolutely, people. It's just, it's just easy. You know, just go there, it, do it yourself. Who wouldn't and leave. use it? Is what the question <laughs> I keep asking. But, but that's the question. So if I if you ask me initially, it took a bit of time. Yes. And you know why? Because uh, I recall um, I uh, was doing a study on scan and go with my car for team and uh, people were struggling you know the, the numbers were not many uh, mm -hmm. not very strong so we stood in a corner and we were just observing people what they're doing okay so we saw people uh, you know mothers with children or single people coming with the trolleys and then trying to grab that gun trying to understand okay so what should i do what's the process there are three four steps all right and the steps are written there and then um, people are still struggling so i spoke to my colleague he said Oh, the steps are written there. Uh, then what we conferred was concluded was even they're written there. So either they're not in the right manner or if, uh, so people are still struggling to get that, uh, you know, those steps done. So what we did was for the first few months, we, we had a kind of a checkout uh, ambassador who was training people, talking to them, okay. uh, helping them out. But then it becomes a habit. Once you've done it once or twice, then there's no stopping. Yeah. Right? And I think now about 30% of our checkouts are digital. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I still struggle when I go to the airport, which angle am I supposed to give my passport and everything. <laughs> so, but that education is important. There's someone who's kind of helping you. But I think that education's perhaps from a year now, you may not need that. And everything's going to be quite unmanned and, you know, self-service will be the next big thing. You're, you're collecting a load of data, as we've said. Privacy becomes a question on a lot of people's minds. How does that fit in to your CX experience? Because you want to use the data, yeah. but there is a privacy element. So I think if I um, take a step back, I was uh, reading a few reports and when I speak to my CII, so, uh, so people are willing to give data. The report from Forrester that said about 40% people, they are willing to share data, but they want something in return. Hmm. You know, so when I say something in return, it could be, you know, some kind of perk. Or I think a big proportion of them wanted... Uh, that data to help them. You know, the brand should use that data to help them or personalize stuff for them. So to my mind, collecting data, if I look at from privacy perspective, people are willing to share data. Uh, it is uh, important that uh, your trust in the brand, okay, is paramount that people share data with you. So that's the first thing. Second is you have to, um, you know, create that promise around when you're collecting data, this is how you will use the data. Hmm. And then... When, it, when you have the data, so you, of course you have to be ethical, you have to keep those promises. You, know, <laughs> you should use that data ethically. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, if you, you collect the data, so we take basically consent, uh, whether we can reach out to you, whether you can use this data or not, and we are bound by the privacy laws, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the point I'm trying to make is, people are willing to share data. That's if you create that right trust, if you create that right incentive for them, mm -hmm. and you are ethical or you keep your promises. Mm -hmm. I think as far as it's a win-win for the consumer and the brand, I think that's where it becomes okay. But the worry with consumers is if you're just using it without them them getting anything in return. But yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And the digital, more so in the digital world, where you have to accept those uh, cookies. So a lot of people, you know, uh, will say, okay, I will do only uh, necessary cookies. And some people say, okay, so this is going to be helpful for me. But again, uh, if you think yourself, what kind of brands will you accept all cookies? The brands you trust, okay. the brands you know, brands who are ethical in the market, you know that these people will use my data mm -hmm. in confidence and for me. Okay. So, so I think marginal for them, 
is a brand is of course it's very trusted it's one of the most oldest established brands so i think you don't struggle with that issue so much i mean people if you're asking for <laughs> data if majid al fatim is asking for data i'm okay to share it yeah. <laughs> that's i guess the psyche but the onus is after that i mean the customer's work is done after that the onus is on us <laughs> 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 the responsibility is with us right. that we you know safeguard that data and use it for the right purpose yeah, a lot of organizations now have ethical committees i was having a, a talk the other day and uh, there was someone on IBM from IBM that mm-hmm. was there and they were, they have an ethical committee that uh, because they deal with a lot of data and they, the committee's responsibility is to check if there's any kind of misuse of data mm-hmm. and and they're just checking that that's that's an entire team doing that yeah. absolutely we we have a, a security team mm-hmm. who looks at every you know kind of channel or every uh, data usage mm-hmm. so how the da- data is used who all are privy to that data how are they using it are they able to send it outside or not and with all that data that you've been talking about that you have where does ai fit in ai is interesting <laughs> <laughs> ai is a very vast topic <laughs> you can sign up okay go on and on you did but i i think ai when you know daily there are new applications coming out to help us deal with data i mean it must be an exciting time for you indeed absolutely recently i tried uh, for one of my voc programs I was doing a insights, uh, you know, a kind of exploratory study for one of my brands, and um, so there were about ten thousand people who responded to, to to that survey, and we had about ten thousand verb teams. Hmm. So I I tried uh, my hands on generative AI. <laughs> I put <laughs> I, I put Jet GPT on uh, on work and put in all ten thousand of them. I think within a matter of a uh, few seconds, I got a decent summary. But what I would say is that was uh, probably my starting point. Okay. Mm-hmm. I got ahead of time. Uh, it accelerated my, you know, instead of uh, reading through some of them, uh, because I can't read ten thousand, right? I'll probably read hundred, two hundred, three hundred, five hundred max, and that's about it. But it gave me a good base to start my exploration journey, and then I used my business context on top of that. I cleaned that up for things which are, you know, I know that which are not correct because AI is right. AI, right? And AI gets trained. So probably if I start using that. I, in a few months time or a few uh, iterations it'll start giving me better results but that's one secondly i think um, again reaching faster to insights um, data visualization so that's something which is also interesting how do you use ai for your visualization so if you put in the data they'll give you the right kind of things so you do not have to you know you know uh, do that uh, uh, transactional work or mechanical work to come up to insights yeah. they will get to you faster correct now yeah. you have to evolve correct you know so you have to mm. evolve on uh, how do you use that information faster how do you make decisions faster with them mm. and you're right i think generative ai is a is a game changer because in the multiple steps of data collection so data collection was automated like we've been doing it uh data analysis is automated uh but when it came to the recommendations and summarizing part that was still very manual and i think that's where generative ai kind of fits in and like people like us technologies like have integrated generative ai in our technology which is not only reading data in thousands but in millions of data points and kind of analyzing that and giving you summaries and recommendations based on that so it's it's quite quite a game changer absolutely and uh, i think uh, uh, the way ai is evolving now the models are being trained they're going to get uh, better from here yeah, yeah. another no, use of ai very interesting is personalization Mm. So we use uh, data uh, to create those look likes or create those personas and see uh, what can uh, this person do next. We basically do a little bit of predictive uh, analysis. Yes. Uh, when we understand, you know, whether this person gonna churn tomorrow or not, can we do okay. a, a proactive intervention rather than looking at yes. uh, the customer six months later and say this customer hasn't come to me for the last six months? Mm. Can mm. I do something by that by that time the customer okay. is last. Crystal ball gazing. Where do you see this whole field going in the next two years? Ah, uh, interesting question. So, if I see, I think uh, two things which comes to my mind. One is uh, uh, the experiences are going to be more immersive. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you have a lot of technology which is uh, coming up. You have AR, VR, metaverse, and we are right. also trying our dabbling our hands with. So, we have a mall of uh, uh, metaverse. You should try yeah. go there. Really. And, yeah, yeah. So we have all the shops in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so immersive experiences, uh, uh, which will be a kind of a game changer and differentiation with uh, the regular experiences that people have. And it could just be, um, you know, when you are going to a grocery uh, store, imagine that you are wearing your Oculus, and mm-hmm. you are trying to figure out, you know, what to buy, what not to buy, and buy it in metaverse, pay in crypto, <laughs> and so on and so forth. That's that's one. Uh, but I think the second interesting uh, piece is. Uh, 
uh, using AI technology at scale. Mm. Because uh, if you look at the last, next two years or three years, or the last two, three years, in fact, a lot of new technologies have come. Some have died their own death. Some have, uh, you know, gained that hype and they're on the hype cycle. Mm -hmm. But I think um, I what I, it's kind of a wish, not a crystal gauging, <laughs> that some of these uh, stay and are adopted at scale. Uh, and I think the third thing would be uh, on AI itself, because you brought up the topic of AI. Right. So can AI, uh, you know, decode emotions as well? Okay, mm. not only transaction or not only data points, mm. can they, uh, you know, uh, understand human emotions? Then it's gonna be really, really, really powerful. Yeah. And I think AI with AI, the, the topic which you talked about earlier on data privacy, that's a risk. You know, so yeah, they, they, the access to data, what AI have, the databases uh, are, are available everywhere. So if AI becomes, uh, or I wish AI becomes more ethical and data privacy, um, you know, comes as a big, big tenet. So that'll be really, really helpful for the, for the discipline. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting points. I think one I'm going to pick on on because it's a personal favorite is emotions. Because uh, we used to measure, like I'm talking our you know, example for when we were analyzing a lot of data when it comes to experiences, we used to do positive and negative and perhaps neutral and kind of see that. We've layered, but we realized that that's not the full story because a positive, whether it's a happy positive, whether it's a surprise, whether it's an anticipation, if it's a, a, a negative, whether it's fear, sad, upset. So there are different degrees and different expressions. And that's something we've started tracking actually. Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay. so we've kind of uh, been able to now AI allows you to kind of track, pick out words that kind of be associated with the emotions. And it's still evolving technology, but yeah, very high levels of accuracy when we get in terms of measuring oh, emotions. Yeah. I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, that's <laughs> good. But I think uh, one of the, uh, another thing which I will see is on a people side. So because a lot of people fear that AI will take their jobs and I think that's one of the uh, topics which have been yeah. uh, pertinent. Uh, but I think it's all about upskilling and how do you Correct. use that technology to your own benefit. To my mind, it can, accelerate insights and you know get mm. faster to the decision help the customer even uh, much much faster than what we used to do in the last two three years so that's something which i'll recommend people to you know uh, just go to i don't know coursera edx or whatever take an ai true. course uh, yeah. and i was speaking to uh, a group of bunch of um, uh, mba students a few weeks back there were 300 students and they were asking me questions about ai and data and analytics and my recommendation is one of the girls actually, she stood up after I delivered my keynote and she said, um, I'm an HR, why should I uh, learn about analytics, you know, or AI? <laughs> so then I then I gave her examples on, you know, people analytics, churn management of employees and, you know, uh, again, prediction of churn and okay. so on and so forth. And so my advice was, you, you when you, if you're studying, take a course on analytics, take a course on AI, irrespective of whether you, I mean, you, you should not be uh, thinking that you're an engineer who is uh, doing coding to understand all of that. You can very well be a user and everybody is a user today. Everyone's a user in today's So, so you have to have that, uh, you know, uh, bent of mind and uh, technology uh, gonna help just help you propel. I, I wanna jump back just for a second. At the start of our conversation, you mentioned that you have the, the, the luxury of being able to judge CX. Course, yeah. Can you talk about some of those, some things that you've seen that you've gone, wow, I wish I'd thought of this? So one of the topics in CX is uh, really hot these days is how do you calculate a CX ROI? Okay. Right, yeah. And which is uh, a very difficult topic and it's kind of a holy grail. Yes. Right. So what we try in our organization and, uh, you know, I listened to a few of those pitches and understood was you had to be super simple. So if you are, you know, looking at um, uh, a business which is generated from a, a campaign plus a good experience, so how do you attribute that whether the advertising campaign has brought in those customers in awesome. or did your experience on the ground converted them? They have to go hand in hand. So, so two things here. One is you have to keep it simple. You have to be, befriend your finance team, okay? Get that attribution right. It may not be... 100% right. It cannot be 100% right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but you have to be a good judge and it has to be an iterative process. Once you have done that, so then you can make that business case and that's one of the things which I um, have seen in those, uh, you know, pitches is that uh, some of the people are really good at making those business cases, befriending their CFO, getting that input in and then getting executive sponsorship by presenting those business cases to their C-suits. 
Once you do that, there's no looking back, right? Mm. Then you have a massive, massive positive momentum. Because once you go after that for your funding or your resources, I say, all right, you did well in the last project. Let's do it again. Mm. So that's, I think, one of the very fast, uh, very interesting, fascinating things which I've seen. And um, I think second is, how do you engage people on the ground? If you ask me, my company has 50,000 employees in total. Out of them, probably 70, 80% would be frontliners, hmm. okay, who are listening to or interacting with customers day in and day out. How do you engage them? How do you get ideas from them? So one of the things which you try and do is, we call that as voice of employee. And it's not employee experience. It is the employee's perception of customer experience. Okay, so I was uh, working on a checkout project with with Carrefour, uh, with the Carrefour team, and the Carrefour team led that project. And one of the things we did was we spoke to all the cashiers. the bu The business problem was, or the customer problem was, uh, that uh, the checkout time was pretty high. People are getting frustrated, and it could be, you know, if you look at the customer psyche, it could be the perceived time. So because uh, you probably will enjoy putting stuff in the uh, in the cart, but when you are waiting there, you just want to go out you, know, you want to check out pay money and go home or you know go to the next leg of our shopping so this um, uh, required a lot of data gathering so we had <clears throat> exit interviews we had uh, a lot of uh, voice of customer data we did a lot of observations and we also spoke to the staff and when you involve staff i mean you get fabulous insights because That's these true. people are the ones who are mm. having their ears closest to the ground and they will tell you things you can't imagine you can't think of so I think these, these two things, uh, how do you use your employees? How do you um, uh, engage them in your decision making and your exploration? And uh, how do you put up ROI cases? Amazing stuff. What a great conversation. Thank, yeah, you. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Yeah, thank you for having me. You have been listening to Consumer Connections, a podcast brought to you by Scylla. Our guest on this podcast has been Ankish Agarwal, Group CX Senior Manager at Majid Alpha Tame. The theme of this podcast has been unlocking consumer experience with technology and insights.